He is the one and only Tyron Woodley, who returns to action on March 21st, main event of UFC London against Leon Edwards, a very important, a very big fight at 170 pounds. And he is kind enough to be joining us all the way from Phuket, Thailand. It's uh, very late over there. We really appreciate him staying up to talk to us. Tyron, how are you? I'm doing great. I've got a nice picture of me as well, so... That makes me in a better mood. Of course. I mean, I don't think you ever take a bad <laughs> picture, uh, if I'm being honest. Um, I appreciate that. want to talk to you about Thailand and, and, and what you're doing there and obviously this upcoming fight, and it's going to be a big year for you. Um, but I saw you you mentioning uh, the, the tragic passing of Kobe Bryant on social media, and I know as a father, um, you know, you, you relate and, and as an athlete, and I'm just wondering you know, what, what he meant to you and, and how you are dealing with this. I'm still in shock, if I'm being honest. We just spoke to DC about him as well. How are you How are you feeling about this news? You know, to, to be honest, when you think about Kobe Bryant, a lot of people think about him just as an athlete and what he did and his legacy. But I think about, you know, his, his, his the way he dealt with adversity. You know, everyone in Los Angeles wasn't always, didn't always have the kindest words to say about Kobe Bryant, but he took it with stride. He always went out there and he executed. He did what he had to do. And he cemented his legacy uh, professionally. Um, when you look at his involvement with his daughter and as a coach and, you know, just a businessman, when he came and spoke to us at the UFC Fighter Summit, you know, he just was very sharp, very intellectual. And um, he seemed like he had his head right on his shoulders and just talking about the body armor and all these other investments. And, you know, it was someone that if you got an opportunity to sit next to, um, it would probably be nearly impossible for you not to leave with some new inside knowledge. So just hearing the tragic, I was here in Phuket and obviously the time zone was quite a bit different. So my phone started to blow up around 3 a.m. I'm like, what the hell is going on? Everybody sent me a message. And even to the point right now, it doesn't really seem real. Um, but the thing that really sticks out to me, um, obviously the, the, the other people on the plane, the pilot, the other passengers that, that lost their lives uh, due to this tragic um, crash, but I just started thinking about as a father, your job is to protect, to provide, and to basically be there for your kid. And the only thing I can just run through my mind is what do you do in a moment where you see a plane, you know what's going down, and your daughter's there, and she's probably, you know, yelling and screaming and crying, and you can't do anything to save her. And that stuff just really shook me up. It was a really big wake up call for me. And life is not promised, life is short. And we got to be a little bit more mindful of what we do with our time on Earth. When he um, went to uh, talk to you guys in 2017 at the fighter retreat, did you have a chance to, to speak to him? Have you ever actually had a conversation with him? Yeah, I spoke to him for a second. Yeah, yeah I spoke to him um, very briefly. Um, it wasn't a very long, drawn out conversation, but it was just, he was really sharp. And I just wanted to ask him a couple questions about business. You know, you know me, I'm always trying to do something different um, than the norm. But just a lot of people, when he was investing and learning different languages and soccer, and they just didn't know a lot about him. I really didn't even know his involvement with body armor until um, the actual summit. So just where his mom was at, this was like a company that wasn't even really on the board yet. And uh, I'm not trying to promote the company either. I'm not even representing about him. But it was just it was just that he saw things futuristically, whether it's his career and how he would end. No, just very, very sharp. I, I appreciate the insight, and, it, and it's hard to, to move on to other things, but I do want to talk about you and where you're at. Um, you're in Thailand right now. Uh, when did you when did you get there, and why did you decide that this was the right thing for you right now to go over there and, and do at least part of your camp there? Well, I was working in um, um, doing the ESPN desk. I was doing um, ESPN desk in Singapore, and then, you know, I've been talking um, a ways ago to Mike, probably like 2013, about coming out here and training and, you know, I just really never had the time. And then I just made the time. I said, all right, well, UFC, can you guys please just change my flight? I want to go spend two or three days in um, Thailand. It was more like just go see Thailand. It wasn't so much about the training. But if anybody knows Mike Swick, Mike Swick for a very long time was like the number one contender and he was supposed to get title shots. And he took a couple of fights just because that was his mentality. And it, and it basically forfeited his opportunity because he lost a couple of fights that would have put him in title contention not only at 185, but also at 170. But the thing I remember about Mike Swift is when I was training at AK as a young whippersnapper, you know, DC hadn't even really started yet. It was Luke Rockhold, who was like a, a, a rising star in strike force, but it was him, it was Koshek, it was Jake Shield, 
Um, it was John Fitch. It was a lot of guys. I mean, they may have had five of the top seven welterweights at that time, but his work ethic and his cardio and his conditioning was above everyone. I've never seen him. And him and Kane, Kane Velasquez, because Kane's a heavyweight, um, they really just amazed me. And when I started thinking about getting back to my roots and I started thinking about getting back to the grind, anywhere I go, training-wise, I always try to take a piece. So a lot of the conditioning and the things that I learned that came, things I brought back home. So I wanted to get myself away from everything, away from the distraction, away from the bullshit, away from the toxic um, you know, situations. It's just everything that, that basically did not allow me to be physically or mentally present. I was physically present in my last fight, but if anybody knows Tyrone Woodley, they know that was a non-characteristic fight of me. So when I came out here, one in Milwaukee at this time, it was like negative 50 weight chill. You know, I was on antibiotics. I was sick. You know, I did Wildin' Out. I did Family Feud. I did Hawaii Five-0. I dropped my whole album. You know, I had some personal stuff going on in my life. And none to make excuses, but I'm always built to have a lot on my plate. I'll never let someone tell me to limit myself. I'll never, never let someone to tell me, you know, to sit on gifts that God gave me and just do this one thing. That's not how I'm built. Um, I don't even know if I can function that way. When I came out here, I haven't had a cellular phone call with anybody in maybe two weeks. So I'm in the jungle. Like, not, not like, oh, I'm in the trenches. No, I'm dead ass in the jungle. Outside of my window is monkeys, snakes, and the damn cat. They just keep begging all damn night. <laughs> so I'm literally in the jungle. I'm secluded away from everything. I'm in different time zones. People can't really bug me and ask me for money or whatever the hell they might do. So it was just something that I needed. And then I came out here and, and my cardio, I lost 15 pounds since I've been out here already. My cardio is insane. I've been training my ass off. And um, I just really felt good about it. So I asked Mike if he would be okay with me coming back. So I'm going to go home for a couple of weeks, hug up my kids, especially after that tragic uh, Kobe Bryant deal. And then uh, I'm going to hop back on a bird and I'm going to come back out here. I'm going to do something different. I always see my kids before um, before I go out uh, to my fight, but I'm going to come back out here and I'm going to go straight to the island. Oh, wow. Uh, so does that mean that you're going to have a different corner for this fight? No, I should have the same corner. Um, I, may, I may not have my coaches for as many weeks, but um, the, the techniques and the lessons and how to break down film and the, Communication. Thank God for FaceTime. Thank God for text messages and videos. We can do a lot of this stuff uh, virtual, but I may not have Dean for a full eight weeks like I have to. So I want to. Now we have lost Tyron there in the jungle, as he said, joining us from Thailand. Uh, we'll reconnect with him in a second over here. A uh, very important fight, obviously, coming up for him on March 21st in London. Important fight for him, an important fight for Leon Edwards. Edwards trying to cement his spot as the number one contender at 170 pounds, and there's no better way to do that than against the guy who held the belt for so long and, and, and Tyron trying to uh, right the wrong, so to speak, of uh, last March, that fight against Kamar Usman. Walter Wade probably right now, arguably the most interesting division because of the inclusion of Conor McGregor and uh, the, the Jorge Masvidal rise and, of course, Two, Usman three, four, five, six, and Tyron Woodley coming back. Leon Edwards, uh, Tyron, you're back? Yeah, I'm back. I'm sorry about that. No yeah. problem. So in total, how many how many weeks will you be there? Uh, well, I told Mike I was going to start doing a pre-camp here where I come out here two weeks before the eight weeks. Um, so I've been out here, it'll be two weeks before the eight weeks when I leave. And then I'm going to go over two weeks. So I'm guessing it's almost six weeks more. So it's going to be a total of eight weeks. Okay. Um, and I remember the last time that we spoke to you, uh, you weren't dismissive of it, but you didn't seem incredibly keen on the idea of fighting Leon Edwards next. In the end, why did you decide to take this fight? He's going to get fucked up. He's going to be the next one. Unfortunately for him, he must not do his research like I do. The fighters that have talked the crap, that have, you know, what they thought they should do from an entertainment standpoint. Like a few beats ago, he was like, oh, Tyron's a great champion. Actually, the fight that we're watching right now, um, RDA, he had the perfect opportunity 
to ask to fight me. You know why? Because I was the one calling that fight. I called that fight. Uh, not called that fight. I was on the desk with the fight. And we had him up for interviews. And he didn't ask to fight me. He's, you know, oh, if you would please come out to London. And he was so graceful and so pleasant. Now, all of a sudden, he's, you know, taking on taking on the lead of everybody else. And uh, this fucking division is getting so corny and it's starting to irk me so bad. I just really need to come back and just try to fuck everybody up because I'm just, I'm so annoyed with everyone. And when I get to that point, it's a very, very dangerous point. When I was fighting Darren Till, everybody's talking about how young he was and how old I was and how focused he was and how I was doing all this other stuff outside the octagon. You know, he don't even care about his kids in Brazil. And, you know, he's the next Conor McGregor and he had this many people come on, da, da, da. And I said, all right, cool. We'll see. And what happened is he got his ass that it was probably my best performance of my entire career. And I feel more, I take this more personal than I do Darren Till. So if that gives you any indication of how I feel, uh, my condition in this insane right now, um, everybody's like, man, dude, I don't know how the fuck you got it. I came out here, I was sick. I was on antibiotics, uh, you know, and then over like two week period, I legitimately, just came to a crazy state and something just clicked. And uh, I'm doing the old shit, the stuff that's not cute. That I say, everybody want to hit mitts and shadow box and spar. Nobody want to be on the tear down bike doing sprints. Nobody want to be running three, four, five miles. Nobody want to be sprinting up hills with tires and feel back. Nobody want to be doing the things that suck. That's what I'm doing right now. I'm doing the stuff that suck so that I can go out there and I can shine. I don't have to um, guess. I don't have to hesitate. I don't have to hold anything back. I can just run through the small front. Everybody needs do, do you find you find yourself yourself still thinking about the Usman fight? Like, do you still lament it and harp on it, or do you feel like, or maybe you need to get through this fight to get over that one, or are you officially over that night? I'm officially over that night. It took a while, but yeah, I'm, I'm officially over. Okay, and now with this opportunity, have you been told? All right, you beat Edwards. You're next. You're getting that title shot. Have have they given you any kind of indication? Damn, I look fucked up in that bitch. <laughs> um, they have not. Um, and like I said before, my goal, right? Like, you got to recognize who makes the most money in our sport, not the world champion. Right. The, the, the people that make the most money are guys like, I think, less or so, or freaking Masvidal finally making his paydays. He's at the top of the list now. So was the Diaz brothers. So was Conor McGregor. Some of these people have never had a belt. Cow, Cowboy Cerrone just earned a big payday, never been remotely close to a world title in the UFC. But you look at guys like Demetrius Johnson, who was pound for pound, and he was making less money than Joanna and Jay Shed. And you think about people that really, 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 this sport is about being the best of the best in the world title belt before they start incorporating new belts and doing different things. It was You were supposed to be the top dog. And in no other sport are you going to see Stephen Curry making less than somebody because they're talking crap and they want to fly a suit to the presser. No, he's going to make the most because he's draining threes in your face. So when you, I probably should have used a, um, a, a rapper, especially after they won the, um, <laughs> the NBA, <laughs> the NBA final. I know Ariel's all good. Used, I get, you know, I get the analogy. Could have used, um, we get the analogy, but, but, but right now my goal is just really, really to just focus on winning and just proving it to the people that support me and the people that believe me myself i'm capable of so much more and the good thing about me is i haven't even peaked yet i have not peaked as a professional yet and you look and i'm looking back at some of these fights that you guys are clicking through a leon networks a kumar usman a kobe covington none of those guys are going to make me that much more of a great than a carlos kind of than a robbie lawler than a josh kasha than a dun young kim the people that are going to put my name in the record books are the people i've already this shit's just personal now. Mm. And so, all right, so we're in this position now where welterweight is is wide open. Do you have a, a take on who Usman should fight next? Do you or how this whole thing should play out? Uh, I mean, <clears throat> if we look at certain, <clears throat> if we look at other people's hands, we peek over the poker table and we look at different sets of hands. Um, it would be no case where Yayana and Jacek didn't get an instant rematch or Ronda Rousey or Cody Garbrandt. Um, or you see Holly Holmes on the way back in the title fight so many times afterwards. 
we've seen these things happen like that. Like, I'm not even guaranteed a big uh, a title shot after beating Leon Edwards. Right. So how does my deck of cards look a little bit different when I'm the one that actually defended four times and won four world title fights in a year? Not, okay, you look so awesome. Kobe's so tough because he got his jaw broke and he kept going. No, I tore my labrum in a world title fight, and I went on to defend 20-plus shots. I busted my foot against Kelvin Gaston, and I went on to win that fight. And these all happened in the first round. I busted my hand against Darren Till. I said, fuck it. I've only landed two elbows in my entire MMA career, but how many elbows did I land in that fight? Because I couldn't throw my right hand. So um, these are situations where, you know, I don't get the credit for enduring and winning. Some people endure and lose, and we give so much. We give so much credit for losing our sports. Hilarious. No other sport does that. You know, oh, oh my God, you know, this team lost in the AFC championship. Man, did they, they were so tough. No, you fucking lost. We're talking about who won the Super Bowl. We're not talking about how tough you was because you endured a, a basketball game that went a double overtime. We're talking about the person that put up their last shot to take them on to the final. But in our sport, we pick and choose when we want to fly that. And, and I'm sure there's a part of you that laughed a little bit when you heard, you know, the UFC brass saying, Holloway gets an immediate rematch. Where was my immediate rematch, right? You were the first person I, I thought of when, when that narrative came out afterwards, when, when he lost to Volkanovski. Oh, yeah, immediate rematch. You had just as long, uh, if not a little bit longer of a title reign than Max Holloway. You know, um, you got to know your deck of cards. And I can, I can cry with spilled milk and I can, oh, boo, 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 I can do that. Or I can just say, hey, these are my deck of cards. I'm going to play the shit out of this hand. And I know what I got to do. I got to go out here and I just got to focus on victory. Dan Lambert told me this a long time ago. He said, Tyron, just win. Focus on winning and everything else will fall into place. So right now my focus is going out and beat my next opponent. Um, barely even deserving of me to say his name. Um, but I'm just going to go out there and I'm just going to whoop his ass. And sometimes people, I, one of my sayings is they think they want something, but they don't really want to. He will very, very quickly find out that. He got locked in the cage with the wrong motherfucker. And by the way, I love this idea of the, you know, the the guy who was at the top of the mountain, the champion now, going to the the bare bones living situation that you're in in Thailand. Could you like what is in back of you? Like how small is this place that you're living in right now? You no, know, this is my this is my fridge. Wow. This is my um hello. This oh, wow. is my recording studio. Sweet. Um, I got a nice little... The bed's right in the middle of the fucking room. It's <laughs> weird. Um, but yeah, you know, I'm, I'm right here. And, and it's not just it's not just Thailand, you know. I'm going back to the basics in general and living a more simple life. Like, I blew through a lot of fucking money, man. A lot, a lot, a lot of money. And I was, you know, jewelry and fucking VIP and all these experiences. All those things that came with the, with the championship life, you really... When you come from where I come from, you never imagine making that type of money. You never imagine being in that type of position. You work hard for it, and I didn't get there by accident because I was busting my ass, but nobody taught me finance. Everybody taught me one plus one is two. That's math. That ain't finance. That ain't wealth. That ain't investing. That ain't saving. That ain't tax. Um, that's basically you made money and fuck it, you spent it because when I was growing up, we spent it when it came in. My mom's check was already cut up. It was done before she even got it. Mm. We had to pick which utility bills was not going to be on that, that month. And it was it was something that I didn't recognize as a kid that wasn't normal. I thought everybody had to do that. So when you start making money, I bought like seven cars and fucking two houses and all these trips. And nobody ever lifted a fucking hand when we was at a restaurant. 10, 15 people to eat dinner. And, you know, I was going fucking the VIP clubs and all this shit like every other week. And I just imagine making that amount of money for a very long time. And they very quickly said, poof, damn, hold on. Like, you're going to tell me March 3rd, like, this is different? Like, it's not the same? And um, it, it's just a lesson learned. But but I, I like where I'm at. And I know that if I had not been in this position, the hunger, the drive, and I had to go and locate the old tire. The old tire was at the bottom. I came from the bottom, bottom. And when I got to the top, it felt good, but I worked so hard to get there. I envisioned being a champion so many times that when I actually won that belt, it wasn't like, oh, my God. I mean, like, like I was relieved because I had so much stuff in my life personally. 
I don't know how I won. I every world title fight, I had the like if if I unveil, which I will do at some point when it's the right time, if I unveil what's behind the curtains of Tyron Woods, what he went through, ninety nine percent of anybody who's ever had some bullshit to say about me would be like, oh my god, how the fuck did this dude win four world titles against number one contenders? Nobody could figure out the puzzle against fucking Damian Maya at that time. Robbie Lawler was a boogeyman. Fucking um, Stephen Thompson, you know, he was probably the most difficult training camp to ever do. And it's only so long your luck can go. Darren Till is this up and coming fighter. I'm acting like I'm on fucking ESPN. I'm going through the B-roll. <laughs> uh, <laughs> Darren Till was just, he was this up and coming fighter that everybody thought was so much bigger than me, so much more powerful. You know, he's going to back me down and beat me up. And, um, you know, you think about me being able to do that, that was very significant. The way that I did, how I did it, and I stuck true to myself. I didn't allow what people said and thought, you know, to affect me. And I already am to grips that my legacy is going to be greater when I walk away than it was when I was actually 